their legal and their business skills to help missionaries get into places where they otherwise wouldn't be able to get into, and that's going to be their new mission. So you could be in prayer for that, and actually, uh, back in that back room, because of painting, it, it's off the wall, but uh, there is a brochure rack in there that has a brochure about missions, and it lists all our missionaries that we support. It's a great thing to use to be praying for our missionaries and, and the missionary works around the world. Uh, also, if you ever want to contact them, uh, we've continued to try to figure out how to keep our church like in actual direct contact with our missionaries, and he had asked, you know, if you ever want to contact us. Uh, if you ever do, let me know, and I can easily get you connected with our missionaries, any specific one. And it would be great for them to hear from some of you saying, hey, this is so-and-so from Bethel, we're, we're praying for you. Uh, they always love getting that kind of uh, acknowledgement that we're praying for them. So today when we take the offering uh, at the end and when you uh, give online, uh, just consider giving to missions, and, and there's many missionaries that you're helping us support uh, throughout the year. So if you would stand with me. Father, thank you so much for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for salvation, and thank you for an ability to be able to stand in your presence and to seek you and to encounter a living and eternal and all-powerful, loving God. And we ask, Lord, that as we seek you, you would pour out your Spirit and you would bring transformation in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Hallelujah. 
Aleluia. Aleluia.
because your word tells us. Your word is true, Lord, and your word tells us of your character. But, Lord, so many of us know this, Lord, because we've experienced your goodness in our lives. Lord, we've been through dark places. We've been through hard times. And we've seen how you are faithful and true to your word, Lord. And you are true and you are faithful to us. And, Lord, we can sing from the depths of our hearts, Lord, that you are good. You are good. And, Lord, you are a good father. others tell us. Call me deep 
deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Thank you, Lord. Into your love, Lord. things you're not proud of. But his word tells us if you will confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Don't ever forget. He never tells you to clean up your act before you come. We all came to him when we were sinners. And he welcomed us into his presence when we asked for forgiveness. And now we're told that we can come boldly into the throne room of grace. So you need to know that there's a love there that is undeniable. That peace that can be found in his presence is unexplainable. And that he calls you deeper, deeper into his presence. He wants to change you and mold you into his image. And he can do that as you come into his presence and allow his spirit to work in your life. Just encourage you. We're going to sing that, that third verse again and just let those words come from your heart up to his throne room and tell him thank you that he is a good, good father. Aren't you glad this morning 
ourselves to you. Go ahead, give him praise. He's worthy. We offer ourselves to you, Lord, as living sacrifices, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Take this offering that I bring. Humbly I fall on my knees to proclaim your everything, Lord. Because my life's nothing without you. Take my hand and lead me through. You are my sustaining love. I live.
you are worthy. Yes, Lord, you are worthy. What a great God you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we want more of you. We want more of your spirit, Lord. More of the outpouring of the working of the spirit in our lives. What a great Savior you are. Lord Jesus, we ask that as we continue this morning, Lord, that you would continue your work in us. We've worshipped you with song, Lord. We're going to worship you with offering. We're going to worship you by turning to your word, hearing from you. And we ask, Lord, that you would do whatever work you want to do in us, that you would help us to not be resistant to the work of the Holy Spirit that you would help us not to quench what the Spirit is doing, but that we would be like clay, soft clay in your hands. Lord, mold us and shape us into what you want us to be. Help us to see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear. We ask, Lord, for all these things so that your name would be glorified in and through us. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, aren't you glad you're here? Aren't you glad you have a Savior? Amen. God is good. God is good. God bless you. You could be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I uh, looked down at my phone to, to check something and saw there's a fr friend of mine that's streaming with us, and he was saying, who's that guy back there playing the guitar? And uh, gave a good com comment there, so just thought I'd throw that back to Steve uh, on the, the guitar skills there. And if you remember a while back, my, my daughter heard a Johnny Cash song and said, he almost plays as good as Steve does. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, that's nice. It's good to hear, hear things like that, right? Amen. Amen. Uh, God to build up the body. Uh, well, uh, just again, a couple of things. Uh, one, if you do want a printed bulletin, we usually put something on the, on the streaming, but if you want a printed bulletin, 
that is in the back on the table. Just grab one on your way out. Uh, also, the food, May now brings the food again, and we have that in the back. Uh, so just, uh, it's a one-way route through the square there. There's some hand sanitizer, you know, be clean and everything, but there's food back there if you would like to uh, take some of that food. Uh, also, we're continuing to, to uh, take up an offering for uh, this coming Wednesday. The food pantry will be open next door, and we're going to give some gift cards to the people that come uh, to help them offset some of their costs for Thanksgiving. And so if you're willing to help with that, just mark Thanksgiving on your memo line of your check, on your offering envelope, or on the, on the website. Just click Other and, and put in there that slot that it's for Thanksgiving. Same for missions. If you'd prayerfully consider giving uh, to the missionaries, we would greatly appreciate that, uh, as well as making use of the various playlists and stuff. But uh, I, I still want to, to extend our gratitude myself. I know the board would say the same. Every month when we meet together and look over the finances of the church, it's amazing how uh, God is providing abundantly, uh, so much so that different projects, needed projects, have now been able to be addressed and uh, we're actually making plans for potential other things, like we're praying. You can pray with us. We're praying about whether or not uh, God is calling us to increase the amount we give to our missionaries, uh, and we're in a place where we could do that, and that's you guys uh, sowing into God's kingdom. So we greatly appreciate uh, your willingness to follow the Lord's leading and being uh, generous to Him. And you know, how, much no, how many of you know that you can't outgive God, right? that he will always over, overpower you and bless you with his generosity uh, no matter how much you give. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you so much for the generosity of your people, and we thank you for the generosity that you show towards us. And uh, when we leave today, as well as those online can do that now, when we give, Lord, we're giving out of a sense of gratitude in our hearts that you've given us so much and out of a sense of love in our hearts that we want to contribute to the work of the kingdom, to the missions work around the world, and to benevolence needs. Lord, we want to demonstrate love to people and glory to your name. So take this offering, use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. sorry, I started singing. You said, take this offering that I bring, and I started singing the wrong song. I am so sorry. My apologies to the worship team, all of you out there streaming, and everybody here. We'll try this again. And I am standing beneath your wings, and I am resting in your shelter. Faithfulness has been my shield, and it makes me want to sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and I will bless your. Days bless. 
blessed be the name. Sing, blessed be the Lord. Blessed be. team and I think that was not a mistake on Joe's part he wanted to give me an illustration for my message this morning <laughs> uh, actually it is kind of fitting as we've been praying about and learning and studying through hearing from God and the ways that the world can impact us uh, we very easily can pick up things subliminally and so he uh, was subliminally influenced by my comment to sing a particular song without even realizing it <laughs> uh, so it, it's very vital that we realize that our bodies are made a certain way, our minds are made a certain way, and it just, if left unattended and without us paying close attention to, it just kind of drifts and goes in a direction, and we have to watch for that. Uh, so turn with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 3 as we're still walking through this book, and we're going to pick up at verse 16. We're going to look at three verses there. Daniel chapter 3, we're going to begin at verse 16. And years ago, when my nephew, who's now 15, was uh, three, no, maybe five years old, and we were at a church function. We, had, we weren't here yet. We were at a church function, and there was some food, and there were some cookies. Now, what food item do you think a child's going to want to go after first? The cookies. And uh, he was sitting at a table with us, and we had a friend sitting with us, and and. Heather told the friend when she got up, make sure, because I told him he has to eat food, like real food, which is kind of funny to say real food, but you know what I mean, non-sugary food first before he eats the cookies. And he was kind of getting sad about that, and he said he wanted to eat the cookies first. So Heather walks away from the table, and he looks at this, this lady, and he says, I really want to have a cookie it makes me so sad that I can't have a cookie. And then he starts getting teared up. And then she starts tearing up. And I don't remember what the outcome was, if she gave him a cookie or not, but if she didn't, she had a hard time with that. In fact, when Heather came back, she was still crying. <laughs> because people know how to try to move us and, and try to pressure us in a direction and and we have pressure around us all the time, don't we? To make certain choices, to do certain things, to believe certain things. And sometimes those pressures are coming in the form of, of threats and, and negativity and attacks and, and those kind of things. And sometimes they're coming at us in a more charming and, and emotional-based and and uh, tempting and wooing you in kind of thing. And those of you that are parents know that kids have a knack for both sides of those. They can either drop on the floor and go into a wild tantrum in which many of parents have succumbed to the pressure of that and given in. And they can also be quite charming and use all the charm that they can to get you to do what they want you to do. And so we find ourselves today in a very pressure situation and know that just because you're, you're experiencing pressure does not mean you're supposed to resist the pressure because there are times when someone is trying to pressure us to do something we should not do and we need to resist. Then there are times that people try to pressure us to do something we should do, and we need to go along with that. So the answer isn't just to simply resist every time there is pressure. In fact, preaching is a form of pressure. Witnessing is a form of pressure. Uh, so is uh, uh, doing service. There's all kinds of ways that people can try to pressure you uh, to do things and we need to figure out how do we go with what the Spirit is showing and not just simply go with the lead of the pressure. And we see in this story that we're going to capture a, a remark from that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
as they have encountered pressure situations, the king Nebuchadnezzar, he has this dream and he gives this threat because he needs to know its interpretation. Daniel ultimately gives him the interpretation and his reaction to that is bad because he decides to make a statue in which he demands people worship the image of the statue or they be thrown into the fiery furnace. And because of that, some Chaldeans see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not bowing to the statue. And so they go and they tell on him for various, tell on them for various reasons. And then Nebuchadnezzar in a fiery rage is, is reaming them out and threatening them and, and trying to convince them to, to again bow to the statue. And then this is the reaction that they give to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, we find ourselves in pressure circumstances today, not quite to that extent, not anywhere near to that extent, but we find ourselves in pressure situations. What a glorious year 2020 has been as we entered into the year and within a few months COVID shows up. And if you don't wear the mask, you are unloving to your neighbor. And if you do wear the mask, then you're bowing the knee to Caesar. Uh, then we get into the race issues that surfaced. And then we get into an election year. Don't you love election years? Uh, and all of us behaved incredibly Christian-like and had a lot of the fruit of the Spirit when we interacted with politics and we gave glory to Jesus in our behavior. And there is all kinds of pressure around us to behave certain ways, think certain things, say certain things. Don't you love it when you try to stay neutral on something and somebody keeps trying to force you to give an opinion? I remember one time someone trying to force an opinion from me, and my response was, you don't really know what, want to know what I think. You don't want to know what I think because you're just going to attack me no matter what the view is. And people put pressure on us all the time. And how do we make good choices and do the right things in the midst of those pressure situations? And we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response to Nebuchadnezzar, and in their response, and in the things that happen before and after, they give us some idea on what we need to do in pressure situations. We can do the right choices, make the right choices, if we do two things. One, have the right view, and two, have the right approach. So what is the view that we need to have? Did you notice that they said to the king, we do not need to answer to you? Did you notice that? Now, on the surface, you might think that that means that they're being disrespectful. And they're just kind of shrugging them off and saying, we don't need to answer you. But notice first that they said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. They are still addressing him with respect. And note that they still give him an answer. They still talk to him and still give an explanation. So th this is not a uh, dis form of disrespect. It would go against what Daniel and them have done to this point. Because if you remember, they are under threat. And many times they made polite requests. And they were very calm with the way they interacted with them. So this is not what he's doing. In fact, what he is doing is he is acknowledging that we don't have to answer to you. Why? Because we have somebody else that we have to answer to. Because at the moment, there is a conflict between what government is asking me to do and what God is asking me to do, and I have to choose God in that instance. In fact, if you remember a similar situation where Jesus is standing before Pilate and he is under threat for his life, he is going to be crucified. And Pilate says to him, I have power to decide what happens to you. And what was Jesus' response? He said, you only have it because God, because my Father has given it to you. And so Jesus acknowledged that there is a greater issue at play here than just the threat of my life. And so the first thing we have to have in view is that we are going to be judged by God. 
One day, all of us will stand before God and give an account for the way we lived and for how we talked. And that should act as a restrainer. So when you decide that you're ready to act or speak or do or think or feel, remember that God's going to judge you for what you're about to do. And that should restrain us. That should hold us back. But many times we don't think about that. We think about the pressure. Well, how dare they talk to me that way? Or somebody needs to set them right. And uh, we feel the pressure of, well, I, you know, what if they don't like me anymore? Or what if I'm not in with that group anymore? Or what if I don't fight? What will people think of me? And we get all these things. What if they hurt me? What if there's danger? And when tension comes, we are thinking about us and our own circumstances. And you know what's interesting? I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I think they understood that if they bowed the knee and they decided to worship an idol, an image, they knew that there was a greater furnace that was way more worse than this furnace they were staring at now. Because they understood that after this life is much more important than the present circumstances. So when you find yourself facing pressure and you want to give in, remember that God will hold you to account, and it is a much greater issue than someone not liking you, someone hurting you, even killing you. It is more significant to be right with God. Second view we need to keep in mind, notice that they said that our God, in verse 17, is able to deliver us from this furnace. God can do the miraculous. Did you know that? So when you find yourselves in circumstances that everything says this is not going to go well, this will not work out, nothing can change about my circumstances, you see no hope on the horizon, there's no hope that things can change, remember that you can stay the course if God's called you to it because even if there's no circumstances, those can change in an instant. You're talking to the God who said mountains and there were mountains. You're talking to the God who in the flesh walked on water or caused the the sea to part. You're talking to the God who makes things happen instantly and stuff come out into existence that wasn't even there to begin with. And so when I'm facing pressure and it looks like I'm going to lose, I need to remember that just like Gideon when he had fewer people and other people when they had fewer people on their side, they remembered that they had God in their midst and he can do the miraculous. And I can overcome and make the right choices because I'm not afraid. I'm not fearful of what's going to happen because I know God can deliver me. However, there is a tension with that concept because there's another side to a reality for us that they acknowledge in their statement. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, What do you mean, even if he doesn't? I thought that God is supposed to spare us. You you mean that I could actually end up in that furnace and just burned alive and God would allow that to happen? Did you know that God allowed Jesus to be crucified? Did you know that God allowed Stephen to be stoned to death? Did you know that God allowed James to have his head severed from his body? All kinds of horrific things have happened in this life and God has allowed it. Does that mean that God is for it? Does that God mean that God wants us to suffer? No. But there are times that there are a greater purpose, there are more significant things than us escaping persecution and even death than there are us not. But the problem is, is if I think that I'm going to always be spared, then what happens when I'm not? You see, when pressure is facing me and I know I could lose, will I give in to the pressure because I don't want to lose my life or my loved one or take that risk and those kind of things? You know what's interesting about teenagers? I was reading a child psychology book and it was talking about teenagers. And you know how I say often, because I have done past work with youth ministry and children's ministry, that children and youth are not all that different than adults. Do you ever get insulted when I say that? I hope you don't. (laughs) The Bible says we need to come to Jesus as children anyway. But there's an interesting thing about adolescents. They've done studies on this, and teenagers are fully aware that people die. They know that people can get sick. They know that bad things can happen to people, and they know that they even happen to teenagers. 
But did you know that those same, teen, same teenagers do not believe that any of that stuff will ever happen to them? And did you know that us adults often do the same thing? You want me to show you how I know that? Because we will say, yes, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Yes, uh, Peter said that, that you will grow through your trials and your persecutions and tribulations. We know that that is true. We know by experience that we go through difficult things. And yet, when we go through difficult things, God, where are you? Why are you letting this happen to me? I don't understand. And why, and why are you this still like this? And why would you let that happen? And we demonstrate that we, in our mind, we believe that God will let us go through awful things, but we just don't believe it in our heart. We won't, we won't accept that. And what happens is when the pressure comes, you give up if you believe God's going to spare you from everything. Well, I thought that Paul said that God makes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. He did say that. But do you understand that God sees the internal lifespan and not just your earthly lifespan? So sometimes the good that he brings happens after your death whether it's in your own life in eternity or whether it's in there have been many times that people have been martyred and the people left behind were radically changed because of what they saw and God brings good. Why was it that the patriarchs wandered about through the promised land, not possessing it, believing they were going to possess it and died, never possessing it? Because God's picture is an eternal picture. And if I understand that, if I have that perspective that God can sometimes allow the horrific to happen, then when it comes, I'm still not giving in. I'm still not backing down. Also note that they were thrown into the furnace. And you know by their words that they did not know if they were going to be incinerated by that fire. And if you remember in the following verses, Nebuchadnezzar was so upset that he heated up that furnace to such an intensity that when the guards threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, they were incinerated themselves by that fire. They could have lost everything. Their livelihood, their lives, their position, their status, everything gone in an instant. I can lose everything. Did you know that? Everything. The loved ones in your life that you're afraid to lose can be gone tomorrow. Doesn't matter if you're older than them or younger than them. Doesn't matter if they're healthy or unhealthy, which is sometimes an amazing thing. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the most unhealthy people will live a long life and the, the healthy people die a young age? What in the world? And it's because we never know what to expect. You could lose your home. You could lose your job. You can lose your retirement in a one foul swoop. You can lose your bank account. Identity theft can happen, and you can lose Social Security benefits. You can lose everything. And I'm not saying that to say the sky is falling and you need to watch out because you're going to lose everything. I'm saying that because we have to understand that those are real possibilities. And if we are not willing to lose everything if it comes to that, then when the pressure comes... We will cave and we will make the wrong choices so as to protect the things that we don't want to lose. In fact, remember the rich young ruler when he came to Jesus? The thing that Jesus finally pointed out to him was the thing he didn't want to lose. And it's not that we can't live with money. It's not that we can't have wealth and resources. But if I'm not willing to lose it, that's when it becomes a problem. Remember Job who lost everything? And though not quite willingly necessarily, but he learned his lessons. If we want to be able to do the right thing in pressure, then we have to get rid of the things that cause us fear and alarm and the need to practice self-preservation because you will make the wrong choices if that's where your head is. And so I have to know and keep in mind, I'm going to be judged for this. Imagine if everybody before they posted that Facebook post thought, God will bring this up to me in my judgment Imagine how fewer Facebook posts would take place. <laughs> if I understand God can do the miraculous, He will allow the horrific, I can lose every. If I understand that, I'm not going to lose or give in or make the wrong choice when the pressure comes. But it can't just stop there. It can't just be about the right view. Because, again, like I said, it's not every time that I'm supposed to resist. 
Not every time am I supposed to go on the offensive. Not every time am I supposed to say something. And so how do I know when I'm supposed to resist and how I'm supposed to resist and what is it that I'm supposed to resist over? Well, if you remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they found themselves ser being served up with food along with Daniel. Now, we might argue that th these are no longer matters, these dietary restrictions in the New Testament scenario, and that is the case. But these guys were not in the New Testament scenario. They were still under that law. So for them, these were clear lines that they could not cross. And then we move into this situation in which they're asked to worship an idol. This is a clear line that they cannot cross. And so one of the things we have to keep in mind when we're ready to go on the offensive, some of us are just ready for a fight. Have you ever known that? Some of us are just ready to fight, and it's just the moment someone tries to restrict us in any way, we're ready to just uh, pounce on them like a crazy person. Yes, thank you. I heard that amen, Steve. <laughs> Some of us will never fight, and we're always finding ourselves running and backing down. And the answer is, just like Ecclesiastes says, in fact, the Beatles wrote a song picking up the idea that Ecclesiastes says that there is a time for this and a time for that. But how do I know which time it is? Well, first is that I need to resist over clear lines. If this is clearly wrong, that's when I need to resist. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're resisting over clear issues. Sometimes we fight over things that really God doesn't care about. We just say he cares about. Uh, sometimes I'm amazed when someone says to me, God said... Uh, not that there aren't prophetic things and such, but usually when someone starts out with God told me, uh, usually I'm a little like, oh, okay, let's see where this goes. Especially if they say God told me to tell you. <laughs> then I'm, uh, anyway, uh, resist over clear lines. And by the way, clear lines are the Bible says it several places and directly says it and clearly says it. That is a clear line. But you might say, but sometimes I need to uh, not participate in things that there is no clarity of line. In fact, if you think about uh, 1 Corinthians and Romans, when Paul talks about meat sacrifice to idols and the issues of gray areas, what does he say? If it is sin to you in your heart and you do it, it is what? Sin. It doesn't matter if there's not a single verse that says anything about not doing that or doing that thing. If you have a conflicted conscience, don't do it. So then what is it about the need to resist only over clear lines? Well, there's a difference between resisting in the form of confronting versus resisting in the form of abstaining. You see, sometimes we can just choose not to participate because of a conflicted conscience, but that doesn't mean we need to tell the other person they're wrong. It doesn't mean we need to uh, pick up signs and go protest somewhere or storm Washington, D.C. And before you think I've taken an ideological line, both the left and the right have groups that are doing this. Did you know that? Both the left and the right have groups that are actually becoming militant in doing this. This is not an ideological issue. This is a flesh issue that we face today that people are ready to, to trample over people and take over things over anything today. We're willing to fight over anything what, you said your favorite ice cream is vanilla? No, it's chocolate. I'm going to attack you now. I mean, we just are ready to lose our minds over every single disagreement. Can't we just disagree sometimes? Can't we just hear someone else say, well, I just choose to live out this way? Okay, that's fine. Uh, instead of fighting over everything. And so sometimes it's not a matter of resistance as far as confronting. It's just abstaining. And I want you to know that sometimes one of the most powerful ways to convict somebody is to just not participate in it rather than say something about it. I still remember the day, and I've shared this with you before, when I was working as a bank teller, and I personally don't drink alcohol. Now, the Bible doesn't clearly say that it is a sin to always drink alcohol. It speaks of drunkenness, but not drinking it as a sin. But I don't do it out of a sense of conscience reasons. I have different reasons why I do that. And I never said in this bank, I never said, I don't drink alcohol and you shouldn't drink alcohol. And I just never brought it up. Well, one day we, we won some kind of sales competition and we were going to celebrate afterwards. So they bought champagne to celebrate. And I was thinking, okay, I guess I'll just drink out of my water bottle or whatever. But lo and behold, they bought me a little uh, glass bottle of, um, of non-alcoholic champagne and said, we know you don't drink, so, but we wanted to sell you to celebrate with us. So we got this for you. They got all of that just because of my actions, not because of my words. 
Or one time when I was out to dinner with, with some friends, Heather and I, and we're sitting there, and one of the friends decides they order a pitcher of beer for everybody at the table. Now, they didn't realize that the vast majority of us don't drink, uh, but all they saw was quickly you would see a little quiet conviction on them when nobody was drinking any of that beer. We didn't read them out. We didn't say anything. But sometimes we feel like we have to say something. They have to know. You, you know what? Most of the time they know. If you're the person that feels like they have to know, they probably already know because they've probably heard it from me before. And so the question is not whether or not I need to resist. It's do I need to just simply abstain from this or do I need to confront it? Third approach that I need to have is if you remember last week's message, and if you weren't here or didn't get that, again, you can listen to it on either of our social media platforms or on the website. The, the human impulses that are going on when this is taking place, uh, the, the, the Chaldeans that were uh, feeling a sense of malice towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, possibly because of their offices they got, possibly because of their nationality, uh, but they had some kind of offense towards them. Nebuchadnezzar had this need for uh, being affirmed and needed this uh, control and those kind of things. And when we interact with things, we need to remember and be sensitive to human impulses that are happening all around us. Did you know all the time people are reacting by human impulses in flesh constantly? Did you know that? Whether they're good or bad, it's constantly happening around you. And just before you think that you got to watch out for those people, you also have to watch out for yourself because you are always being led by impulses. The question is whether or not you follow them. Anybody care to say that you are never frightened? You never face anxiety? That you're never concerned about insecurity that you feel towards others? Anybody? Yeah? No, I don't see any hands for that. That's odd, not for sure. Uh, I see that hand. <laughs> we are always prone to fear. Why did you think Jesus had to often say, fear not? Why did Paul have to say, be anxious for nothing? Because nobody struggled with it? Why is it that David had to write in Psalm 139 that I am fearfully and wonderfully made because no one wrestled with identity and whether or not they were secure emotionally? But if I understand that, then I can know when I'm about to do say this because I'm afraid. When I'm about to do say this because I'm angry. Because of those emotions that are happening in me. And then I can use self-control and kill the flesh and walk in the spirit because I can't say that right now because I know it'll just be anger and fear talking. And if you're talking in anger or fear, you're not talking by the Holy Spirit. Mm -mm. Thirdly, notice that they say to him that they will not bow to the statue. And the reason why, uh, that when they said that uh, God, our God can deliver us, but even if he does not deliver us, we will what? We will not bow. We will obey him. And notice the emphasis over obedience versus the miraculous. You see, so many times we're looking for the miracle to deliver us out. We're looking for a rescue. We're looking to be bailed out. And that's great when God does that, and He does it sometimes. Doesn't He do that sometimes for us? He bails us out of situations that, that sometimes we got ourselves into. But there are other times when God just expects you to obey even if the circumstances aren't great. But if your goal is, but God always works together for the good of those who love Him, and I'm sure that it'll always turn out better. And uh, did you know that if you ever tell somebody, well, I'm not, I, I don't know how this is going to turn out. Did you know that means you have a lack of faith and Jesus doesn't like you anymore? Now, some of you are not sure how to react to that because you know that sometimes you've been in prayer with people who have corrected such thinking because if you were to say that it might still go bad, it means you have a lack of faith. That's not at all biblical. Was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego acting in a lack of faith when they said, even if he doesn't? Was Paul, when he said, I know when I go in to Jerusalem, I'm going to die? Was he acting in an uh, act of disobedience towards God? Sometimes it's just recognizing what's actually happening. The apostles, in fact, many of them knew they were not going to make it out of this world easily because they knew what was happening around them. 
and they were reacting the right way. In fact, it makes me think about this. Uh, sometimes people get all caught up in the fact that Jesus and the Pharisees blasted people. But you know what's interesting to me? John the Baptist was telling people, stop doing this sin, stop doing that sin. But do you know what was pretty much always coming first? The people coming to him saying, what must we do? He wasn't seeking them out. They were coming asking, what must we do? In fact, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't demand to see the king over this injustice. They were dragged before the king. When they were in the midst of thousands that were bowing down, they didn't stand up on a soapbox and say, this is why you're wrong. They just didn't bow down. And sometimes God's call isn't for us to be an army to take over and conquer. Sometimes God's call is to be wise and do the right thing at the right time. Will you stand with me? Worship team, will you come and prepare to lead us? And Joe, if we would do your great name. There is a time for peace. There is a time for war. There is a time to love and a time to hate. There is a time to heal and a time to fight. I might not know all of your circumstances, but the Lord does. And as much as I would love to be able to give a canned answer, which actually I don't like canned answers, but there's actually all kinds of instructions that can be given to you this morning on how to respond because it depends on your circumstances. For some of you, you need to know that you are going to be called into account before God. For some of you, you're given into your flesh, maybe even for, quote, God reasons, but you're giving into your flesh and you need to remember that you're going to be called into account. You need to repent before God because of your becoming a loose cannon, if you will. For some of you, you, you are stuck with circumstances that you don't believe God can ever take you out of. And the result is you've given up on trying. You've stopped praying. You've stopped pursuing. You've stopped acting. You've stopped doing the different things because you don't think God can take you out of that. And so for you, the answer is that you need faith to be resurrected back in your heart to believe that God could do the miraculous. But for others of you, you just keep believing and believing and believing and believing and believing while failing to see the lessons that God's calling you to learn in your suffering asking God to take away the pain before the lesson was ever learned. And for you, the reaction is, God, I just need to let this happen. I've been fighting it. I've been resisting it. I've been calling it evil, calling it satanic. But now I see that for me, I need to walk through this fire. And there's a submission that needs to happen with you, a trusting in God. For some of you, you have that thing that you won't let go of. And I bet most of you, if you were to think for a moment, you know exactly what the one thing is that if God took that, it'd all fall apart. And you need to do something with you and God. For some of you, there's confusion in the way to react to things. You don't know when you're supposed to fight and you don't know when you're supposed to lay down. And the reason of that can be many things. It could be your lack of study of Scripture. It could be your lack of a prayer life. It could be a lack of you allowing God to work out the flesh out of your life. It could be many things. It could be a chosen blindness. Did you know that usually if you're blind, you chose it? We see things. Uh, sometimes we start to have questions that surface and we try to silence them fast because they don't feel good. And all the while, God's trying to wake us up to something that we don't want to be woken up to. But if we decide to become alert and aware and decide to start paying attention and seeing, yeah, it might take us to places that are scary. It might mean that we have to allow for things to change in my life and around me. But if it's God that's doing it, 
Whose hands are better for you to be in than his? But perhaps last of all is, are you willing to walk down the path that God has called you to walk down if it means filled with blessings or if it means filled with trials and persecutions and losing everything and even my death, are you willing to continue to go forward with his plan for your life? Whatever it is that's holding you back, whether it's fear, whether it's anxiety, insecurities, whether it's your flesh or you need control, whatever it is, if you let the Holy Spirit do a work in you, oh, the great things that can happen. So I want to encourage you at, at this time when the, Holy, when the worship team leads us, come and lay yourself at this altar, kneel before him, repent, seek his face, and let him do a work in your life today. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your series on Daniel and particularly to look down the road of eschatology and study of end times and you know that that's not my favorite subject to dive into because one because I see it's a distraction at times for the work of the kingdom and yet there's indications all around us that the tensions are mounting It's going to be very difficult at times and days ahead to be on the right side. Partially is because, just like that angel before Joshua, 
because many, if not most, or all the groups are all partially right and partially wrong. But we're so engulfed in our culture and in our agendas and in our security and the way we want things to be that we are more often trusting in man than we are in God. I'm telling you, if you fail to be in God's word, what does Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you are not in the word and in prayer, and if you are not alert and aware and paying attention, and if you are not humble, Joyce, will you come here for a minute? Will you come here for a minute? Now, typically... When you have a young lady such as Joyce, come up on the platform. You do not admit or ask for an age. But this lady's a little different because she always proudly says what her age is. Which I'm going to say 81, but is it 82? It's 82. 82 and proud of it. And I know that Joyce is like me, that she likes things to be a certain way. But at 82, which at many times when we get older, we just decide that we've reached a point in our lives that we no longer need change to happen in us. At 82, I'm still astounded at the humility and the way that she has adapted to changes that have happened around her and in her life that speaks of a humility and a flexibility that is really what opens the door for God to move and God to work in our life. And it's a beautiful thing for us to watch uh, the way God works through her. And I pray that more of us would be like that, where we're not so quick to form an opinion and so quick to judge and so quick to react. Instead, we follow James' advice to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And you know, that doesn't just mean waiting till the other person's done talking. That means to slow yourself down on this whole judgment train and forming opinions train and getting things a certain way and reacting to things. The world does that. The world wants to react all the time and they want to have an opinion all the time. You can go on YouTube and you can find an endless sea of videos of everybody's reactions to everything that happens. But God wants us to be slow at that so we can hear. Amen? Isn't she a great lady? Uh, So, Father, we ask that you would help us to truly be people of the Spirit. We don't want to be necessarily Assembly of God or Baptist or Pentecostal or Evangelical or whatever term you want to throw at us, conservative or liberal or whatever. We want to be people that are being led by the Holy Spirit that are listening to the voice of God. And so we ask that you would help us to be that kind of people, that you would make Bethel and you would make our surrounding community be people that are led by the Spirit, that are like Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to see all the things that you want to show us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. He's good, amen. Uh, Thank you for being with us this morning, and uh, join us next week as we continue through Daniel. Uh, But again, thank you for being with us. God bless you, and see you next Sunday.